Thank you. And welcome again. We had a good day in Nanaimo today. Kind of a busy day, running back and forth, but uh, nevertheless, we had a good day meeting with the folks there. A lot of uh, seasoned saints, and they have their meeting in the middle of the day. So that accommodated us very well. Now, some of you asked for outlines, and I know a little bit from experience that oftentimes uh, when you make outlines, other folks want them too, that didn't ask for them. So there are some copies, I think, I don't know if John has them or, or uh, who has them actually? Ralph, maybe? No? Yep. They're at the door. They're at the door. Oh, we get them on the way out. So there's two handouts. There's one on the, the linear outline that we were looking at, the very uncluttered one I said. And then there are also um, one that shows just a little bit of the structure of the book. I think Jack and some others asked for that one. And so um, you're welcome to help yourself to those on the way out. There may be another CD or two copy of my testimony that someone requested. I think I've given them to just about everybody who's asked, but if you didn't get one and like to have it, you're welcome to have that as well. So let's look to chapter 15 of the book of Revelation. And verse 5. Chapter 15 and verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, or bowls, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Look at verse 1 of chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial or bowl upon the earth. And then drop down, if you would, to uh, chapter 17. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, or the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And then let's look, if we could, into chapter 19. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people, verse 1, in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, 
and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And so we come now to, uh, well, to say the least, a very interesting section of Scripture, but also not just an, inter an interesting section, but one that we'll have to give a little bit of special thought to as we move through uh, the details of chapter 15 in the end, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Notice the book of Revelation says at this point, that the temple was filled with smoke from the very uh, glory of God, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And so what is opened in heaven at this point is the what is called the temple of the tabernacle. Now, if you'll notice this word that's used here for temple, uh, the word that is used there indicates the very holy, holiest place, the very inner sanctuary, if you will. And so at this point, this inner part of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and what was seen, rather than being so much an, an article of furniture like we've seen in some of the other sections, is after these angels come forth, there is seen the smoke, as it says, from the very glory of of God. It is as if now the Holy of Holies has been opened up. And in the interior of that Holy of Holies, smoke, which indicates the very glory of God, the very presence of God Himself. And we remember, uh, I don't know how well we'll be able to see these, I just have a couple of pictures of this now, but um, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, this column of smoke by day and a column of fire by night that resided upon the Ark of the Covenant in that particular place in the, in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, that inner room of this uh, inner tent, the holy place here and the Holy of Holies here, and it was the very presence of God, it was the manifest presence of God, the way that God presenced himself there among the people. There on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubim was the glory of God, which was manifest in that physical phenomena of the fire by night and the column of smoke by day. Oh, that's a bit of help. Yeah, I think so. And no picture would ever do it justice we can only imagine in our minds what it may have looked like. I think, all things considered, this reminds me of one of, the, of my favorites, as the priests would have gone in only on the Day of Atonement, one day a year. By the way, you know we should never take for granted the great privilege we have as believers in the Lord Jesus, Amen. what he has accomplished. Because that veil that separated the priest from that Holy of Holies in that day, as good as the system was that God had designed, God designed it, the law, the Mosaic covenant, covenant made at Sinai, God ordained. And yet, the best that that system could do was to get one man, one day a year, into the presence of God. That's the best it could do. And you and I now, who are believers in the Lord Jesus, are able, because of what He has done on Calvary's cross, 
to enter into the direct presence of God, male or female, all believers, with equal standing, nobody closer than another, no man that you have to go through, no hierarchy that you have to go through. Never let anybody rob you of the wonder of what it is that God has accomplished and what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ has purchased by the shedding of his blood to be able to make us a kingdom of priests who can go directly into God's presence. Imagine that. You can do what Aaron, the high priest, couldn't do. He could only go in there one day a year, one time a year. That's all he could go into God's presence. You, essentially, and I, we live there in reality, and functionally, we can go directly into God's presence, and there before the throne, make our petitions known. What a wonderful and, and, and tremendous privilege has been won through what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. And so I want for just a minute to think about this section of Scripture, if we could, and make a few comparisons, which is what this says right up here. You crane your neck really high back like this, and you'll be able to see uh, what it says on the top. Comparison of the judgments that occur in section 3 and section 5. Now, one of the things you'll find, again, in the Word of God is the symmetry that's found in the, in the Word of God, because the, the Bible is a very sophisticated book. And by sophisticated, I don't mean that it is a book that is beyond the understanding of all who have the proper equipment, which is the Spirit of God who is able to show us His truth. I don't mean sophisticated that it's locked up for a few of the elite. What I mean is that it's sophisticated in that because the Creator of the universe gave us this book, the very design and the structure of the book, well, we would expect it to be anything but a, a simplistic in a sense. We find a beauty and a symmetry to the very way that the Word of God is put together. Again, we see God's fingerprints all over it. And so, while we don't have it here before us, looking at sections 3 and sections 5, we noted it briefly, though it was, some of the parallels, I think, between section 2 and section 4. But you'll notice in section 3 and section 5, that in section 3, in chapters 8 through 11, we have the trumpet judgments. These are the vile, are the bold judgments. And you remember, brief though our reading was, that in this section, it was a third of the sea, a third of the rivers, a third of the sun, and so on. While over here, all of the sea, all of the rivers, and the sun scorching men. And then, if we'll remember back into section uh, three at point two, which was chapter 10, there was an angel that descended with a little book. We saw one clothed with the sun, and we remember that that proclamation went forth, no more delay, the mystery of God is finished. What we see here in someone's hand, the hand of the woman, is a cup of wine. Not clothed with the sun, but clothed and decked out, if you will. We'll see more of that in just a minute. And while the mystery of God was here complete or finished, over here it is the mystery of iniquity. Remember in this section the holy city that was this should be trod underfoot for 42 months. We have brought before us here an unholy city. A great multitude here giving thanks. The time of God's judgment and avenging has come. We see that too in the hallelujahs at the musical comment of point four in this section. Section three brought before us the problem of suffering in the silence of God, the apparent unanswered prayer that has gone on, and God rewarding. For section four, Babylon. Two chapters that will have to do with Babylon. Responsible for the persecution of the saints and the corruption of teaching, and God avenging the prophets and apostles and rewarding. Now this is a lot to take in, I know, on a Thursday evening, and a lot to go over in our minds to think about, but at least to briefly for a moment be able to point it out, just to show you again the balance and the symmetry and the, and the beauty of the very construction of the Word of God as you find it here. You may not agree with everything on that outline, 
or that the way that these contrasts are there, but it's certainly interesting uh, for us to be able to think about. And if we could have a light again, please. Or at least if I could have it, what are you going to do? Thank you, brother. Thank you. So with that little bit of uh, thinking about introduction, you'll notice that in chapter 17, John is led to see uh, the, the character of Babylon and the judgment that occurs upon what is called Babylon. Now someone has remarked in the past, and I think there's a great deal of merit to it, that when you come to the book of Revelation, if you took your Bible and, and physically sort of were able to, um, you know, fold it in like this, that the book of Revelation would fold, in that sense, neatly into the book of Genesis. Because what you have a beginning in the book of Genesis in seed form is come to full fruition in the book of Revelation. It's sort of come full circle, if you will. And you'll remember that the beginning of Babylon, uh, or of the place called Babel in our Bible, it was a place that began in opposition to God. Back in Genesis chapter 10, you remember its founder was a man named Nimrod. And Nimrod was a, a hunter of men's souls. And part of the character of Babylon had to do with its founder who sought to, in a sense, steal the souls of men, of human beings founder of Babylon. Babylon was founded as a society that excluded God. It was a society that was founded for man's glory. And it was a society of a false religion based upon a one world order. It was an amalgamation, if you will, of religion and society joined in one mixed up bunch. The state, in a sense, and religion combined together in opposition to God. It almost sounds contradictory, doesn't it? How can you have a, a religion that's opposition to God? But you remember that God had said, spread out into all the earth. And in Babylon, they said, let's come together and let us build us a city. Let us make us a name. And God said, we'll go down and have a look. You remember that it's not long after that. As a matter of fact, it is an immediate sequence to that. Where the Lord calls a man named Abram. And it's so fascinating to think about. He calls Abram out of the land that is called Mesopotamia. Or as it is known, Ur of the Chaldees. Or as it is called, Babylon. Or as we call it today, modern day Iraq. It was the land of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And God called Abram out of Babylon. How did he call him out? Stephen will remind us in his speech in Acts chapter 17 as he recounts the history of Israel and says, the God of glory appeared to Abram while he was in the land of Mesopotamia. And in that sophisticated society of Abram's day, that advanced civilization, the God of glory appealed to him. He turned his back on Babylon. He turned his back on Ur of the Chaldees. And he went out to a place that God had called him to, not even knowing where he was going to, but the God of glory had appeared to him. And he was willing to turn his back on everything else. Because the God of glory, well, the glory of that place paled in comparison to the God of glory. And one of the things that's going to come out in this section is these different variations of glory. As a matter of fact, one of the controlling thoughts, as we've seen, that which is connected with the temple or the tabernacle, as this section opens, we see the very glory of God. Babylon was a society that came together, first of all, geographically. They came together in one place. They came together, second, ideologically. They were all united by one purpose. Third, they gathered together linguistically. They all spoke the same language. And I'm going to suggest to you that fourth,
they came together religiously. Because many of uh, people have noted in studying that passage in the book of Genesis, that when they said, let us make us a tower whose height is like uh, up to the heavens, uh, it may not have been that these people thought, you know, if we just build a ladder big enough, we can get up there where God is. But like many of the ziggurats of that day that we've seen archaeologically, Crispin is aware of those, that um, uh, around the top of many of these structures were astrological signs. So that in a sense what they may well have been saying, not let us make a tower whose height, uh, you know, we can reach up into heaven and get, get to God, but whose top is like the heavens and covered with these astrological signs the worship and the, the um, giving into astrology of the day. So they were united with a religious purpose, an ideological purpose, a linguistic per, uh, connection, and a geographical connection. And you remember God went down and scattered them. And he scattered them linguistically, and he made them babble. It was a place of confusion of tongues, and it's interesting, isn't it, that when we see Babylon in chapter 17 and chapter 18, we won't have time to go into it tonight in full detail, but let me just say that there are three aspects to Babylon. There is a religious aspect. There is a political aspect. And there is a commercial aspect, all linked together in one unity, in a one world religion without God and it comes to full fruition in that particular day she appears in chapter 17 as a harlot one who has seduced the people of God the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her the inhabitants of the earth made drunk with her and there's a striking parallel between what we find in chapter 17 and what we found in chapter 13. You remember there the beast who was a male perversion of power and who would force and compel worship no matter what he had to do. And if that was a male perversion of power, we have before us now a female perversion of beauty. Using her beauty if you will, what beauty it was, to seduce the people of God, to draw them in, and ultimately making herself drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs. Even chapter 16 and verse 6 says, they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. She represents that which is corrupt and idolatrous, but yet religious. And I want to say something. I want to be very careful. I try to be careful wherever I say it. I don't hesitate to speak the truth uh, wherever I have opportunity to do so. It is not just the Roman church. It is not just the Roman church. Now, undoubtedly, there will be many who will be united under that banner that the Scripture calls Babylon. And so, we want to be careful in our identification. Although there is no doubt that a church with such wealth and power and even political persuasion will undoubtedly, and I use the term church in the very broad sense, will undoubtedly have an influence, not only as it does in the world today, but as it will in the world in that day. Ultimately, the worldwide worship of the state will be introduced. There are ominous forebodings of that in Scripture. You know, we live in a very advanced Society, You in your part of the world, I share the same hemisphere with you, I think, last time I remember, as bad as I was in school, but uh, we here in uh, North America, remarkable advances have been made, not only 
in uh, civilized things that we do, but in politics. We have structure that is somewhat similar. Yours would be parliamentary, ours would be a bit different. Um, and yet, think of the downside. You know, I can only speak by way of personal experience by that which happens below your border. In the same democracy, rule of the people, well, it works great as long as you have good people ruling, don't you? Doesn't it? <laughs> but what happens when the majority of the people no longer rule in a way that's good? It's democracy gone to seed. Think back into the history of the Bible, into a book that must be understood to understand this book of the Revelation, the book of Daniel. You remember when Nebuchadnezzar was king? When Nebuchadnezzar was king, the king was law. And whatever the king said, that's what happened. Well, what happened when the king said, I'll put a statue in the plain of Dura, and you'll either bow down to the statue, or you'll be cast into the lake, into the fiery furnace. And progress was made. Political empires changed, and along came another king, Darius. And in the day of Darius, it was more of a democratic type of rule, if you will. No longer was the king law, but the law was king. And you remember that phrase that we sometimes use, the law of the Medes and Persians. Because Darius got duped into passing a law that even he, the king, couldn't change. And what was the law? A law that caused someone, similar to what Nebuchadnezzar had done, to violate their conscience. A law against Daniel in the area of his religion, that if you make a petition to anybody but the king, you'll be cast into the den of lions. Nebuchadnezzar would have just waved his hand and changed that law, but not under the democratic rule, uh, use the term loosely, of Darius. You see, now the law was king. And not even the king could change his own writing. You say that's an advance. Well, it is in a sense. But what happens when the law then that's made is a bad law? <laughs> and what happens when that bad law causes you as a believer to be faced with violating your conscience to God or following the law? of the land. You have to be careful, don't we? And not trump things up to an area to put them on a level just so we don't have to do what the law says. But I believe we'll see more and more of that coming down the pike. We already see it in our country. We certainly see, as not, not as a pun, but the handwriting on the wall in the area of the world in which you live. And what was it that Darius demanded of Daniel? It really was the worship of the state, wasn't it? No one will make a petition to anyone save they make it to the king. And Daniel, of course, showed the king there was a higher law that could roll away the stone of the den of lions and find him still alive. It's an interesting parallel over what will one day take place worldwide. You see here the nature of Babylon. Listen in chapter 18 and verse 7. How much she had glorified herself, lived deliciously. She says in her heart, I sit a queen. The nature of Babylon and her false glory. In opposition to that which is revealed at the beginning, the very glory of God. Here's the glory of God, and here is the glory of Babylon. It is in this section that something remarkable happens because it differs from the rest of the book of the Revelation. We've already seen the judgments that begin to be poured out upon the planet. First, those judgments that we would classify uh, in chapter 6 as the providential judgments of God. Famine, war, disease, 
death, those type of things. Not unusual in and of themselves, but with increased intensity. And then, uh, beginning in chapter 8 and through chapter 11, those judgments of the uh, trumpets that increase now, third of the earth, third of the rivers, and so on, they're intensified, but yet still partial. Now you come to the final, the final judgments, the seven last plagues, the vials or the bowls of the wrath of God. This comes, notice, directly out of the presence of God. This is not now just the angels coming forth as they did in chapter 8 to sound their trumpets and cause the judgments to occur upon the planet. These are the bowls that are filled with the very wrath of God. These angels have come from the very direct inner part of the presence of God Himself. These are the direct visitations of God upon this planet. It's interesting the language that is used. The bowls. And maybe you remember, even in the book of Genesis, I mentioned it last night, that as the Israelites were about to come into the land of Canaan, there to execute the wrath of God upon those wicked Canaanite civilizations, it was in the fulfillment of that which had been said hundreds of years before to Abram, that the cup of the Amorites is not yet full. That their sin and their wickedness was like a cup that had been filling up until it finally reached its brink and the long suffering of God waited hundreds of years. And at the exact precise moment when those Israelites stepped into that land, the cup was full. And they were instruments in the hand of God to execute His wrath upon a wicked civilization. And now, these angels come forth out of the presence of God with bowls that are filled with the wrath of God to pour it out upon this planet. I don't know whether you noticed or not, but look, if you will, for just a moment at these angels as they come out. The seven angels in verse 6 of chapter 15 came out of the temple having the seven plagues. They were clothed in pure and white linen. Their breasts were girded with golden girdles. Where have we heard that before? You remember the initial vision of the Lord Jesus? as John saw him there, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girded about the paps, the King James says, with a golden girdle. And these angels come out in the very character that is expressive of God's character. They're not some wicked, uh, you know, hag-looking, black-robed, uh, you know, demonic-looking creatures. There's actually something quite beautiful about them and something pure. The purity and the white linen expressive of God's holy character. The gold which speaks again of God's character, that which was the most expensive, that which was the costliest, and which pointed to deity. Girding about their breast in that place of affection, guarding their emotions, in a sense, just like the Lord. They come out now, and what is that character, what is that the beauty of their character to do? It is to pour out the wrath of God upon this planet. The final wrath of God. To fill up the wrath of God, if you will. And the smoke from the glory of God and His power, no man able to enter in to that temple. First went, poured out upon the earth. And you'll notice as you begin these plagues, if you will, that take place beginning in chapter 16 and verse 2, that these judgments begin to mount in their intensity, if you will. 
Listen to the words of the angel in verse 5. I heard the angel, chapter 16, say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They are worthy. Expressive of the righteous basis of God's judgment. Verse 7, I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. The judgment of God. You see, one of the things we learn in this book of Revelation is about the character of God. God will not be hurried to his judgment. God's judgment has waited a very long time. One day it will wait no more. One day it will be unleashed. But even in that, there is a beauty and a glory. They will express, Lord God, you are righteous, you are holy, you are true. When God's judgments ultimately are poured out, they will, have been see they will be seen to have been just, and righteous, and holy, and right, and a cause for the praise to the glory of God. They will know to have been right. We will know it as they ultimately are poured out. And one of the indicators is found even here. Let me just pause to say for just a moment, again, do we not see the character of God? He hasn't glossed anything over. He hasn't hidden behind a curtain. He hasn't had, isn't going to jump out one day and say, aha, look what's going to happen. He's telling us beforehand. He wants you to know his character. Look at him in the full blaze of light of revelation of his word. He's not hiding so you don't find out, oh yeah, you know, I, I really was about love. I just forgot to tell you that one day I'm also going to have to do, I'm going to have to do something really bad. God is not ashamed of his wrath. God is not ashamed of his judgment. Just think of the world in which we live. How long would you put up with a world like this? How long would you put up with the wickedness that you find all around us in this world? And I don't mean just those things that are aimed at the Almighty. He can handle that. I mean the wickedness of what we see. I, I won't even begin to name it tonight in polite company. The vileness of what takes place, the inhumanity, the, the, uh, the injustice that occurs in this world the sinfulness, the corruption. How long would you put up with it? And yet God in His infinite, almost infinite long suffering has put up with it for a very long time. How long would you have put up with a Pharaoh who fed the male children to the Nile River, undoubtedly to the crocodiles of the Nile? How long would you put up with what goes on in your country and what goes on in my country in so-called civilized countries where babies are killed because they're inconvenient at older and older state at, at later and later stages of gestation even once delivered how long if you were god would you tolerate God is not ashamed of his judgment. He's not ashamed to let us see it. And there's another reason. He wants you to know up front. For watch what happens. He begins to pour his judgments out upon the men of the earth, which had the mark of the beast, verse 2. Men were scorched in verse 9 with great heat. And you know what they did? They blasphemed God. The name of God. And notice what it says in verse 9. Remarkable to see. And they repented not. Verse 11. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains 
and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. In verse 21, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, and so on. Once again, we see they blasphemed the name of God. They did not bow down on their knees and repent and say, Oh God, have mercy. They blasphemed the name of God. And because of the character that's seen here, remember this, that this particular judgment does not fall on all. It falls on these at this stage. What would you do with those? You couldn't take them to heaven, could you? Not those that blaspheme God under such extreme circumstance even as this. And ultimately the judgment of Babylon, the seducing false glory of this world. All come to nothing in one hour. Repeated again in chapter 18, the expression, in her was found the blood of prophets, the blood of saints, and all that were, that were slain upon the earth. The false beauty of Babylon. Listen, this world has an incredible pull to it, doesn't it? I don't just mean the good things of the world. Who can't marvel at the beauty of a place like British Columbia in general and Vancouver Island in particular? <laughs> Maybe you take it for granted, but I ride through the Malahat and look at those rainforests and, and just marvel, even with this slight drizzle that you folk call rain. <laughs> <laughs> at the beauty that surrounds us. But we know, don't we, that when the Bible talks about the world, it isn't just talking about the trees and the rocks and the plants and the streams. There is a system that is under the influence of the evil one who is called the God of this world. And it is a powerful, seducing influence with many means, Babylon as we see, <coughs> of seducing people into drawing them into the, its clutches. What a contrast. The perverted female beauty of Babylon, if you will, that we see here, decked out as she is. But then you'll notice something else in contrast. The character of the wife of the Lamb. Chapter 19. To her, in verse 8, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses of the saints. Imagine it, if you will. Draw your mind to it if you can. Think about it. Here is Babylon and her description purple and scarlet and gold and precious stones and pearls and a golden cup in her hand and the pure simplicity of the of the bride of the lamb the lamb's wife in chapter 19 and verse 7 dressed in the character expressive of the purity and holiness of God four hallelujahs that go forth in chapter 19 Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power under our Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. He has avenged the blood of his servants. They sing hallelujah for the righteous judgments of God. They sing hallelujah for her smoke rises up. The four and twenty elders that fell down and worshipped in chapter 4, they fall down now and worship God on the throne. They sing their hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad in verse 7 and rejoice. Give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Note how she is clothed. Fine linen. Clean and bright and white like the character of God. I want to be careful here as well. <laughs> there have been various groups down through the ages, many of them true believers, 
who have identified themselves and their selves only as the bride of the Lamb. But the bride of the Lamb encompasses all those, I believe, who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. as Savior. Amen. Not some certain segment of Christianity as if they had some claim that none of the rest of us have. And I want to be careful to say that the righteousness of the saints doesn't mean that somehow these folks have made themselves something that other folks are not who are believers in Christ. It is that same blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from our sin, that incorporates us into the body of Christ, that makes us part of that bride. Paul says this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, Ephesians 5. And yet at the same time, as we see in this book of Revelation, there are powerful practical lessons for us. The same man who was the human instrument to write this revelation wrote these words. Love not the world. Well, that's easy enough if we think about it in a very abstract way. But he went on to say, nor the things of this world. <laughs> and that gets a little closer to home, doesn't it? You know, I have, we had the privilege when we were married almost 34 years ago. Well, 33, how am I supposed to say it? I forgot. <laughs> Somebody told me the other night, 33 going on 34 or whatever it is. But anyway, um, all those years ago, uh, we had a friend who was a photographer. And he said, you know, I'm going to, as a gift to you as under the Lord, I'm going to take all your pictures for you. And that was a great gift, wasn't it? And it was great because we had family we hadn't seen. I'll line everybody up, you know, and take pictures and all the rest. And, uh, and so he went around taking his pictures. But I have one that's a favorite. <laughs> he went in where my wife was fixing her hair. She's looking in the mirror. And he takes the photograph from behind her. She's looking in the mirror, fixing her hair. And that's my favorite picture. It captured something to me that was special. What was she doing? Why was she fixing her hair? You know, she was making herself beautiful. For who? <laughs> there would be a lot of people looking at her that day when she walked out of that room. But there was one in particular, the bridegroom would be looking. She was making herself beautiful for the one that would be her husband. I think about that picture often when I think about this situation. And since then I've snuck a little privilege. I claim it as mine. I've performed many wedding ceremonies over the years. And I ask very little, if anything at all, except one thing. is the only thing I ever ask. Well, two. <laughs> One isn't really a request, it's a, it's a declaration that if I'm going to do your wedding, I'm going to preach the gospel. Most folks already know that anyway when they ask me, so that's sort of a given. But the one request I, I have, and I don't often even voice it, is that I want to come in and see the bride before he does. <laughs> and I often go back to where the bride is making those preparations at that moment, you know, just before she's getting ready to come out. Executive privilege. The bride making herself beautiful for the bridegroom. And in a sense, in a way, in a very practical way, don't we want to be beautiful for him? Don't we want to, in a sense, think, what is it that pleases him, the Lord who loves us? And what we do by means of sanctification, in a practical way, and separation from that which is displeasing to him, well, I think it's a powerful motivator, isn't it? What is it that pleases him, the one who loved us and gave himself for us? Beautiful thought to think of, that sense of a wedding. You know, it's one thing to think about the bride longing to see the bridegroom. But it's another thing, too, to remember that as much as that 
bride is longing to see the bridegroom, that bridegroom is longing to be with that bride. <laughs> and when you transpose that into the key of, uh, of the Lord Jesus, who said, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, many dwelling places, preparing a place for his bride. What a consummation that's going to be. So may the Lord help us with these thoughts from this section of the book of Revelation to think about that true beauty, the beauty of God's judgment, the beauty of God's character, the glory of God, and what we do as we prepare for the bridegroom in doing what pleases him, to be beautiful for the Lord Jesus, for his eternal glory and his eternal pleasure. Father, bless the word of God, we pray. Take that which has been of the Spirit of God. By the word of God, we pray and, and make it real and rich. Anything that's just human thought or, or human wisdom, help it not to stick. But that which has been of you, that which has been of Christ, make it real to us. It is a powerful world out there, a powerful influence. All oh, the young people. Father, the influence upon them and so in ways that when we were younger we can't even begin to comprehend. And yet, there is one who draws us with a power that is greater than anything this world has to offer. There's one who can win our hearts through his great love and his beauty and his glory. Lord, we know the power of that. Help us, we pray. We give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.